All right. So as I was preparing this um, Bible study tonight, I got to admit that um, I was inspired by um, I was inspired by the Holy Ghost. But um, there was also a song um, from one of my favorite stories and favorite uh, Disney uh, movies growing up as a kid. Um, how many of you have watched Aladdin? You know the story of Aladdin. All of us. Yeah, there you go. Um, Abu, Aladdin, Genie. Of course, I, I'm talking about the cartoon. I'm not talking about the remake. Um, it was the best. I've seen the Broadway play. I've watched the movies. Um, call me a helpless, helpless romantic, but my favorite part of the whole movie and my favorite song of the whole movie is when Aladdin floats up on the magic carpet and whisks Jasmine away and the music starts. I can show you the world. Shining, shimmering, splendid. Tell me, princess, now when did you last let your heart decide? A whole new world. Come on, somebody. Dazzling place I never knew. Now that I'm in a whole new world with you. All right, I'm done. But it's so perfect, right? And um, it kind of, um, I'm li I'm in my own um living my own aladdin right now i got my own my own princess jasmine she wouldn't appreciate i don't know if she's on but she probably wouldn't appreciate that but um we that was my favorite um disney growing up and even today um and if rebecca had a pet tiger and if i had a magic carpet and any if any of us had a genie and three wishes it would just be perfect um but we don't um, but there is a new world that awaits us, and that's what I want to talk to today about, about this whole, this new world that we are, we are headed towards. As Christians, we are anxiously awaiting the day that we can shed this carnal flesh and don a new perfect body, one that doesn't ache, one that isn't sore in the morning, one that doesn't have cancer, one that doesn't, doesn't get feverish. Can I get an amen, Sister Lori? Um, just a new, new body, a new body that we don't have to, we don't have to deal with anymore. We don't have to worry about it falling apart with age anymore. Um, Jesus himself gave us um, the promise of this new world. In John 14, two, through, um, two and three, um, Jesus is speaking. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And Peter, inspired by the Holy Ghost, would pin a reminder to the church, both to the first and 21st century church. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, or as another interpretation, the message would put it, friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. We know from scripture that this planet that we're standing on right this very moment is temporary. We know that our flesh is temporary. We know all too well um, that those um, those that we love, our, our mothers, our aunts, our uncles, and um, th those that leave before their time, our, our, this life is but a vapor. We know that. I'm not here to preach doom and gloom and fire and brimstone, but there will come a day when this temporary home will be consumed with fire. Um, all of its inhabitants will need to find a new home. Um, and this, the spirit that's inside of us is eternal. It's not going to die. So when this earth, this flesh, um, fails us. And when this world, this earth, this planet that we're on fails us, we're going to have to find a new home. And I don't know about you, but um, I, I want to make sure that I, I go to the right home. I want to make sure that I go to the, the home that has streets of gold, that has walls of jasper. I want to go to the home where um, the, the, that God is, is king and Jesus is on the throne. Amen. Um, we are all, um, we are all going to go someday. Um, but we are we are headed to a city where the lamb is the light. There's an old song um, where we that we I used to sing in our old church and um, it was in a red hymnal and it goes, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. 
The angels beckon me me from heaven's open door, door. and I can't feel it in this world world anymore. Amen. As Christians, our eyes are set for that new world, a world that God promised will be without sickness or death, without conflict or war, without darkness, because the Lord will be our light, and it will be a land without sin. We're just pilgrims and strangers in this world. We're on a journey. And we're headed to that new world. That's the place, that's the place that, that Jesus was talking about, that he was going to prepare for us, for his people. And that's why Peter reminds the church that we shouldn't be comfortable in this temporary world, that there's a better place, that we can't settle for this world. We can't settle for the things of this world, that we can't settle for the, the temptations of this world, that there is a greater world. But tonight there are Um, three things. There's three uh, things that are going to get us to that new world. And I want to talk about three ships and a whole new world. How many of you in uh, elementary school remember the the saying in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue? Anybody remember that? Oh, yeah. 1992, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 532 years ago, a brave explorer decided to embark on a journey to the unknown, quite literally. The age of 41, Christopher Columbus convinced Spain to fund a voyage to the edge of the earth and beyond. This trip would ultimately lead him to discover what we now know as North America. And to do this, he took with him three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Each ship had an origin story and a purpose, and while they were not meant for long-distance voyages, Christopher Columbus chose them because he had faith that they would get him to where he needed to go. And just like Christopher Columbus and his uh, expedition to a new world, there are three ships tonight that I want to talk about that will get us through this journey of life that's getting us to a new world. The ships that I'm talking about are courtship, fellowship, and relationship. Three ships, courtship, fellowship, and relationship. The first is courtship. How many of you are familiar with courtship? Um, some might call it dating. Um, the younger um, folks might call it talking or texting or DMing or whatever whatever they call it nowadays. Um, when you look up um, the word court as a verb, it means to try to gain the love or affection of especially seek to marry, to attempt to gain favor of, or to woo. I love that word, woo. Anybody anybody ever try to woo someone? You give them those big old, big old eyes. Um, In my case, my blue eyes have always um, been very um, successful. Um, You know, you go and you put on your your best um, black leather jacket, Ryan, that's up in the closet, um, you puff out your chest if you're a guy. You, you do you do up your hair if you're you're a girl or a guy. You put on your best Fonz impression. It's wooing time. You know you you are you're ready. You're you're about to make a first impression. We don't show up on a first date in our work clothes, do we? We know that first impressions are everything. Everything's got to be perfect. You for sure. You think about what you're gonna do, what you're gonna say. You think about. Um, you know, how you're going to, you're going to, you're going to talk. You think about um, what you're going to tell them because you don't want to tell them everything at once because you don't want them to see your crazy side. You don't bite your nails. You don't chew loudly. You don't slurp the soup. You put on your best behavior, your best manners. You curate the stories that you tell. You talk about the time that you hit 225 in the gym. You don't talk about the time that you ate the entire bag of Doritos in one sitting or the, the entire gallon of ice cream in one sitting because you are trying to woo them. You want them to get to know you, but you don't want them to know all of you all at once. It's bite-sized pieces. You're trying to gain the love and affection of that person. It's only after the first few dates that you start knowing some that you really start knowing somebody that you can loosen up a little. You know, you have them on the hook, right? You know, you feel like you can show them the real you. You court somebody because you feel like you have a connection with them. They could be your person. You end up uh, you could get up, end up being in a serious, committed relationship. This is what courtship is, and it's important. And it's an important part of any relationship. Um, God doesn't expect us today 
to know everything about him after a week of prayer and study or going to church. It's crazy to think that um, we, if the the moment we're baptized, the moment that we receive the Holy Ghost, that um, all of a sudden that we have to be um, at the level of someone that has been um, in a relationship with God for years and years and years on end. It's crazy, and it's uh, un, uh, unrealistic expectations, because it, in reality, the first stage of this relationship that we have with God is courtship that we start building trust with. We start understanding who he is. We start revealing our self, true self to him. We start removing the layers that we've put on over the course of our life. Um, yes, he knows every part of us. The Bible says that he knows every hair on our head. He knows, um, he knows the end from our beginning, but he also wants us to reveal ourselves to him. He wants us to open ourselves up to him. He wants us to be open and honest with him because um, he is going to do the same with us, and a relationship has to be two, it has to go two ways. Um, he made us, and um, he wants um, us to learn of him. There's this constant courtship that happens between um, ourselves and God. God isn't just um, satisfied with just the the top layer, though. Um, he's not satisfied with just the side that we show everybody else. This courtship, what this does is it's we, as time goes on, we start revealing and peeling back those layers. Um, and he is looking for more than just the top layer. He is more looking more than that. He is looking for us to woo him. Um, he wants our wooship, if you will. Um, I'm looking at the chat because I have a feeling someone's about to uh, make fun of me for that. But um, our worship is really just wooship, right? It's us wooing God when we when we were, are in his presence and we say God I love you I bless you I you're my everything I give you my life and all that I am is wrapped up in you I adore you God I I exalt you I want you to be in my life I I want you to be the number one thing in my life there is no one like you I need you in my life I want to know you for who you are I want to dive deeper into your presence to learn your ways to become more like you what are we doing when we when we give God our our worship we're wooing him courtship brings us closest closest closer to him and in that moment as we're talking to him as we're wooing him guess what happens he his presence fills the room and we feel the same jitterbugs the same uh things in our stomach that we feel when we're really trying to to connect with somebody that is wooship in any relationship that we're in we've got to have a, a this this feeling of being able to peel back the layers. And if we're truly going to have a relationship with somebody, letting them into our lives. And the same thing is true of God. A relationship with fir without first having courtship is shallow. If we think it's all about the singing and shouting and jumping up and down and, and the, the, the preaching, the loud preaching, the singing and the right song that gives us the glory bumps, we are missing out. Because true revival is when the people of God become so violently attached to their God, when God is no longer an obligation, but he is a desire. And this only comes when we are in a constant state of seeking to know him deeper than we have before. Because when we are truly seeking after him, when we're truly trying to know him and the power of his resurrection then our relationship can blossom and bloom and it can become something so deep that it becomes more than just what we experience on a Sunday. It, it becomes a, re a relationship where we truly get to know him. Revival is, happens when people um, serve him out of desire and not obligation. The beauty about courtship is that it's voluntary. We're not forced to have a relationship with anybody. We're not forced to be friends with anybody. We're not for forced to um, to court someone that we don't want to. It's a mutual agreement between two people that they have decided that they want to get to know each other. I don't ever want to feel obligated to God. Obligations are never positive, right? It's something that you have to do always just becomes just, ugh. I gotta, I, I've got to pay my taxes. It's an obligation. I've got to go to work. I got to wake up in the morning and I got to go to work. I got to clean the dishes. I, I got to, I got to do this. I got to do that. Obligations never 
uh, turn out positive because it just ends up becoming something that you have to do, but you don't want to do. God doesn't want a got to do attitude. He wants us to want to love him. He wants us to want to serve him. He wants us to want to be in his house on, on a Sunday. He wants us to want to join a Wednesday night Bible study. I want to give God. I want to be in your presence. I want to read the Bible. I want to wake up at 6 a.m. and pray. I want to be in your word. I want to do this. It's not an obligation anymore. I want to do it because I am choosing right now in this moment to give myself and give my time to you because it is worth it to me in this relationship. That is courtship. Because I know that on the other side of this relationship, that you will never leave me and forsake me. That your side of it, you're never going to drop me. You are you don't consider this obligation. You love me with everlasting love. You died for me. You did it willingly. You took my sin upon you because you wanted to, me to have a chance of this relationship with you. So on my side, the least I can do is to give you my life. The least I can do is to give you the, the time of my day. The least I can do is to give and, um, and, and give of my time, of my treasure and my talents to you willingly, not out of obligation. And this is what I learned during courtship. The thing that makes courtship interesting is that it's different for each and every one of us. The way I courted Rebecca may not be the way that you courted your significant other or the way that I make friends and the way that I treat my friends may not be the way that you have friends or treat your friends because um, we are uh, we make friends and we develop relationships differently from person to person. Uh, attraction to other other people isn't universal. How many of you have been walking through the mall or walking through a crowd and you saw a couple and you just said, how in the world did that happen? Am I be, I'm being being real. But how many of you have, have just saw two people and say their opposites must attract because I would have never put that together or that's not someone that I would have um, been with. What attracted me to Rebecca may not have, have attracted Sister Ashley to Pastor. Or, um, it, it's it's unique. Attraction is unique. And the same goes with God. He loves each and every one of us individually. He loves us collectively as a bride. Yes, as a church, he loves us. He loved the church enough to die for us. But in the way that he loves us is unique to us because we are all different. We all have different needs. We all have um, different love languages. We all um, uh, receive love, give love in different ways. And God, because he created us, he knows that and is unique to that. And we should feel the same way towards him. If we only know him in a church sitting, setting, then we're missing out. If you only know him in the worship collectively that we do on church or in prayer collectively that we do on Sundays or on Tuesdays or on Wednesdays, then you're missing out on what is most important. What makes uh, us a part of this church is not uh, just what happens on a Wednesday or on a Sunday. It's what happens apart from a Wednesday or a Sunday or a Tuesday morning. It's the conversations that we have with God in our private time that allows us to help others in public. There's a scripture in Joel um, chapter 2 and verse 15 that says, Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between, between the porch and the altar. The porch was a place of uh, visibility. It was a place that others could see. The altar was a place that was very private to the priests and the ministers. It, they had, they, it was just one-on-one. -on -one. It was the altar. And there's got to be a balance today, Westchester Church, between the porch and the altar in our lives. I can't have my porch, what I do in public, be larger than my altar, which is my private time with God. If the majority of my prayer time is in Westchester, is at Westchester Church when those can see me, or on, on Wednesday night Bible study when those can hear me, or on Tuesday morning prayer whenever I have an audience, then something is askew. We must have an altar that is exceeding our porch, because what... Um, our relationship building with God is not what happens in a group. It's what happens in the one-on-one. -on -one. If you see any uh, celebrity who um, has a very public relationship or a public um, uh, uh, 
marriage or whatever and you you can you can look at the tabloids you can look at the news and you could say man they they have a great relationship i mean we see them i see them all the time they're holding hands they're um they're putting on a show they're they're attending all these parties together they're um they're 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 going to the oscars together they're doing this and that and then all of a sudden um you can see that on a saturday and that that next monday the news cycle is that they're that they're breaking up, they're splitting up, they're getting divorced. Why is that? It's because we can't see their private lives. And I guarantee you what's happening in their private lives is not what they're putting on in their public life. And the same thing goes for our walk with God. If, we, um, if we're not putting in the time and the effort to grow our relationship with him in the, in the, in the altar time, in the private time, in our prayer closet time, then it doesn't matter what we're doing when we're on the porch. Because all of that is just for a show and it's facade. If we're not putting it in in the private, then what we're doing on the porch, um, God is um, God's looking at it and say, I, I I appreciate this, but I want a real relationship with you. And a real relationship doesn't just happen in the public; it happens in the private. Courtship shouldn't stop after you're married, right? Um, the greatest, uh, greatest relationships happen whenever you put in time and effort um, and put your best foot forward all the time that you're you you keep on doing the dishes, that you keep on um, doing what, you know, your significant other likes or um, on a friendship. You you don't just once you become friends with somebody, you don't just say like, OK, now I'm just going to cruise. Now I'm just not I'm not going to put any effort. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to take, 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 and I'm, no, I'm not going to give anymore. No, that's not how, that's not how relationships work. I'm tr constantly trying to woo Rebecca. Sometimes I fail, most of the time I fail miserably, but it's the thought that counts. We will be, um, we'll be married seven years, eight years. Oh, wow. Uh, eight years in June. Um, and we're still in a constant state of wooing. We should never feel like we know everything there is to know about God. We should never stop trying to woo God. We should never stop trying to, to get into a deeper relationship with God and to, and to show him um, our, our everything to him. Our father, our master, our savior seeks to have a private, personal relationship with us. That's what courtship is. It's what's going to get us to this new world. Paul wraps up courtship, I feel, nicely in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him. And that is a very intimate no. That is a, that is a, uh, that is Paul saying that I may, that I may know him, everything about him, that I know what he likes. I know what he dislikes. I know what I know what I need to do in order to make him happy. I know I know what I don't need to do in order to um, to to keep him from from turning away from me. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. He says, "Brethren, I count my not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do: I forget those things which are behind. I reach toward those things which are before. I press toward the mark." of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is that prize? That's our new world that we're going to. For the conversation is in heaven, from which we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work whereby he is able to even subdue all things unto himself. If we are going to make it to heaven, this new world that we're headed towards, we must seek to know him. We must never be satisfied with our current relationship status. We must be in a constant state of courtship, of wooship. We must take a second and every day to say, God, I want to know a deeper part of you. God, I want to, I need you to reveal yourself to me. I need you to tell me what I need to do today in order to make you happy. And I want to know what I need to do today in order to, to get a second date, to get a third date. I need to know what I need to do today to get you, to get myself on your good side. I need to know what anything that you tell me to do, God, I'm so enamored by you. I, it's love at first sight. And I, I don't know you well enough. I need to know, I need to know you more because I'm headed to, I'm headed toward to you. I'm trying to get closer to you. I'm headed 
committed to this world where I can be with you forever. But in the meantime, I just, I, I, my intention is, is plain. I intend to be with you forever. And whatever you require of me, I'm going to do. That is courtship. The second ship that we're um, traveling with in this new world is fellowship. Fellowship. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? That's fellowship. You see, we can't even walk together with somebody unless they're agreement. There's a saying that says, if the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall in the ditch, the ditch, right? If we're going to have any type of relationship with God, we've got to make sure that we are in alignment with him, that we agree with what he wants, that we are, are walking hand in hand with him when we're courting somebody when we're dating somebody we we want to find out things about that person right what is becca like what if she doesn't like and we can still get along even if we don't agree on everything that's normal thank god or rebecca would have left me before we even got married because i have some habits and some quirks still after eight years that drive her up the wall but we have agreed to love each other in spite of those things but we cannot continue in courtship until we move into fellowship, because knowing the shortcomings, the habits, the good and the bad things is necessary for a healthy relationship. Fellowship means the condition of sharing similar interests, ideals, or experiences, the companionship of individuals in a congenial atmosphere, and on equal terms. So God seeks fellowship with us, and that fellowship is the result of courtship. If I'm courting God and I'm wooing God and I can sense him wooing me, then I am moving into fellowship with him. But here is the kicker. In our world that we live in today, we, in our relationships, we say, all right, we'll meet in the middle, right? If, um, if my shortcoming is that... Um, I don't make the bed, right? Then Rebecca says, I wish you would just make the bed, Nathan. And I say, okay, um, I will do my I will do my best. But if I if you're still in bed when I get up, then it's your turn, right? That is meeting, that is meeting in the middle. Probably not the greatest example, but we meet in the middle in our relationships. God does not meet us in the middle. So it is our job to meet him where he is because he says, I am the Lord and I change not. He is not going to change for us. He refuses to change for us. And there are some characteristics and things about God that he um, is adamant about, that he requires for us to have a relationship with him. And the longer we court him, the more that God reveals those things to us, and now we have an obligation now to become like him and to become in fellowship with him. John chapter 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the, at the last day. You know what that drawing is? That drawing is uh, uh, it's God calling us to be more like him. It's God saying, revealing his nature to us and saying, look, um, the longer that we're together, there are some things that I'm not going to put up with. The longer that I'm together, that we're together, there are some things that I'm going to ask you to change. The longer that we're together, there's 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 some things that I'm going to require of you. And that is what holiness is, Westchester Church. Holiness and a, and a call to holiness is to become holy as he is holy. It is to become more and more like him and less and less like ourselves, less and less like our, our flesh, less and less like the world that we are coming out of. Come out from among you. Be separate, saith the Lord. Right? He has called us out of darkness into his eternal life. Right? All those things, the holiness is God calling us into fellowship with him because the next state of relationship 
the next state of our growing and burgeoning relationship with him is he's like, yes, I love the moments where you just come to me as you are. Yes. I love the moments where you're, you're opening yourself up to me. Yes. I love that. But there are some things that I'm going to require in this relationship and it has become like me. It is to um, re- take away the things of the world. It's, it's to, to, to eschew evil. It is to put on this new man, this new woman that I'm, that I'm causing, causing you to become. It is fellowship. It is fellowship. You cannot thrive in a relationship with an absent partner. You can survive it, but you can't thrive in it. Any relationship, spouses, friends, they need to, in order to be successful, in order to produce something, it needs equally engaged parties. That's why God um, didn't design us to be alone. He designed He designed us as social as social beings. It's not good for anybody to be alone. It's not good for someone to go and lock themselves in a room and be alone for for a long period of time. He created us as social beings. And he didn't design he didn't design it just to happen through a screen. We found out through COVID, right, that you can only you can only do Zoom and faith and uh, live services for so long before you need uh, you need one on one contact with somebody. That's why fathers are so happy when their daughters meet guys who live six hundred miles away, <laughs> because he's like, if I, you know, th- there's a big chance that this isn't going to happen if if they're a long way away. Some of you um, know this story already, and you might um, have some good, better context because you you met him um, on Sunday. But my father-in-law is an amazing man. He's an amazing man of God. He's an amazing person. He is the one of the kindest men that I know, um, and incredible prayer warrior. Incredible, uh, just hands down, just an incredible person. He's the head usher at, at the church in, in Pentecostal uh, Cooper City. Um, He's an incredible worker and servant, um, friendly and outgoing. He never meets a stranger. Um, and he and I are, are really close now. But when I started dating Rebecca, it wasn't that way. It took him about two and a half, two years um, to speak to me. So I want to clarify, it wasn't out of hate or disrespect. Um, there were some cultural and personal reasons, but ultimately it all came down to the fact that I was coming to take away his oldest daughter. We started dating at 18 and I don't think he thought I was serious. I don't think he thought that I, um, that I had the, um, that I, that I was here there to stay. Um, they didn't want Rebecca driving to, to Gainesville. It was about a four and a half hour, um, drive alone. Um, when we started dating. So for it, at least once a month for almost two years, um, I would drive that my, um, clunker of a Nissan Sentra, to South Florida to spend a day and a half with Rebecca to spend a weekend. And I don't know how many times I would come up, come to the church. Um, I would go to their church and I would see him <laughs> shaking hands with strangers and, and smiling and working people, working with people on the altar and, and just being, uh, just being raggy. He was, you know, being who he is. Um, and then when it came to me, he would avoid me like the plague. And I was like, man, what, what is going on? And every chance I got, I would reach out and I would say, hey, Brother Ragabeer, great to see you. And finally, after two years of her pastor and her Rebecca's mom and Rebecca saying, dad, he's here to stay. Dad, he's got good intentions. Dad is, you know, you know, all this stuff. Finally, after two years, and my, it was, I was having birthday dinner at, at her house and he came in from work and instead of going to the garden or to his room and, and avoiding me, he came up to me and he said, happy birthday, Nathan. And my heart stopped. And from that point on, it was it was night and day difference. Whenever I asked uh, her parents if I could um, propose and, and be engaged to Rebecca, um, we, they they hugged me and we prayed together. It was it, it was. It it was in that moment that something switched. It was two years of effort for him to real, of my effort for him to realize that I wasn't going anywhere, that I took this relationship with Rebecca seriously, that I respected her, that I respected her family. And I prioritized spending time 
with her and her family because it didn't matter to me if I had to eat ramen um, for a whole month to save money to drive down to Florida. I wanted to spend and be, I wanted to spend time and be with the girl of my dreams, the girl I wanted to marry. And I wanted to show BMO Ragabeer that she was worth it to me because a relationship without effort and a relationship without fellowship is just a shallow experience. And it, it might as well just ch be chalked up to an acquaintance. But if I truly was invested in that relationship and I wanted her dad to see that, I had to put in effort. I had to put myself in the position of success. I had to show him that I was invested in it. I was drawn to her. I wanted to be with her. So I pursued her. And when we feel the drawing of God to be in his presence, to fellowship with him, we must be willing to give up everything, to do anything, to be with him, to be in fellowship with him. The Bible, Jesus says that um, how uh, not to be unequally yoked with somebody. That is, that's more than just uh, a relationship, uh, a romantic relationship. We don't, we got to be careful who we tie ourselves to. Why? Because when we tie ourselves to someone, we're in fellowship with, with that person, right? We're headed where they head. Otherwise we're going to be in constant fighting with where to go. The same thing is with God. If, if we're going to have a relationship with him, if we're going to head where he's heading, if we're going to go where he wants us to go, then we, we got to make sure that we're we're tying ourselves and are willing to go where he's wanting to go. Otherwise, it's just going to be a fight after a fight after a fight. There's going to be friction. We're going to we're all constantly going to be a st in a state of um, not knowing where where we're going and a con constant state of friction and of pain because we're we're trying to go left and God's trying to go right. And God's saying, I'm not going left. I will never go left. I'm always going to go right. And you gotta, you gotta get in line. You gotta become in fellowship with me. And the moment that we just give up and say, God, I just want to be in fellowship with you. God, I just want to walk where you walk. I just want to go where you go. I, I'm tired of of trying to go my own way. I need to be in fellowship with you. That is when we tie ourselves to Him in that way, we move into a deeper relationship with Him because then He can truly start revealing Himself to us. You know what would have happened if I had not pursued Rebecca? She probably would have found somebody else. She probably would have been happy and fine. And if I wouldn't have married her, she probably would have found somebody else, a doctor maybe. She would have made, you know, um, been living in a mansion. Who knows? Um, but the thing is, is what I may have lacked in good looks or lacked in talent, um, I definitely made up for in effort. And I'm not tooting my own horn there. I'm, I'm, truly saying that I want, like I knew that she was worth a month trip to Cooper city every month, even if I had the money or not. And God is just looking for some effort. God is saying this relationship is worth it, but it can't be a one-way street. It takes two to tango. And so we have to be in fellowship with him. And I'm telling you that when God starts to draw you, you've got to respond. Because if we're not careful, we can miss out on it. Knowing the voice of God, sensing the spirit of God, know, when he's calling you into something deeper, when he's calling, when he's revealing something to you and he's saying, I just, if you'll just commit, if you'll just do this thing, if you'll just, it, there's more than just the surface level. There's more than just the, 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 th the, the small things that, that you think is, if you will just go deeper with me. I will, I will reveal myself to you. But in order to do that, it takes us coming out of our flesh and coming out of what we want to do and doing what he is calling us to do. Fellowship is important. Fellowship is, is, um, it should be fun. It should be fun. Somebody uh, used to say, if you're not if you're not having fun living for God, then you're not doing it right. God is not wanting this to be bondage. Relationships with him should not be bondage. We shouldn't feel like his obligation. Fellowship includes um, four C's, communication and conversation. If we're going to be in fellowship with God. We have to talk to him. We have to you have to figure out how to talk to him. You have to figure out how he likes to be talked to. That's why our prayer life is so important. We're all different. 
I'm extroverted. Rebecca is introverted. I'm the planner. Rebecca is the doer. Rebecca is the light sleeper. I'm the log who's dead in the world, dead to the world at night. And for any relationship to work, you have to figure out your strengths and your weaknesses and how we bring those two mindsets together. And this happens through communication and conversation. Your relationship with Jesus has to be intentional. He has to have access to you. He's got to talk. He's, you've got to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. We got to be able to sense and feel what he wants from us. And if you aren't hearing from God, whether that be um, uh, a nudge to a particular scripture or whether that just be your gut, your spiritual gut telling you something, um, if it's an audible voice, lucky you, that's not how God talks to me, but you need to feel his presence. He needs to be talking to you somehow through his word, through through nudges, something he needs to talk. If you are not hearing from God, something is wrong and you need to go back and find in your relationship where the disconnect is happening because he's talking. The question is, is why aren't you listening to him? Why aren't you hearing him? The third, the second, the third C is that it causes a connection. Sometimes it's enough just to know that you're connected. Right before there were smartphones, I had a I had a flip phone. I didn't even have texting at the time. I had Altel. I don't know what's all. Anybody remember Altel? Um, free nights and weekends. Amen. Bless God. Yeah. Hallelujah. That was after seven p.m. and actually changed to seven p.m. At one point, it was nine p.m. Your minutes were free, baby. You could just you could talk the night away if you wanted to. And my first girlfriend, I'm not gonna say her name. And I used to, um, we would wait until nights and weekends and we would talk. And you know how much a 14 year old has to talk about? Not much, but you know what? It was just, even if it was just two people breathing on the phone, <sighs> that was enough for us. We didn't, there were some times we didn't even talk. We just like, just walked around and What's your favorite thing? I don't know. What's your favorite thing? What are you doing? I don't know. The same thing I was doing five minutes ago, but we were connected by George. We were connected. And the same thing is with God. There, That's why sometimes you, if you don't have words to say, but if you can just get yourself away and just say, God, I don't have words right now to talk to you. I don't know what to say. I don't know what I'm doing, but I just need to know that I am connected to you. I just need to know that whenever you're ready to speak, that I'm available. I'm, I just want you to know that whenever you're ready, I'm a, I'm ready to hear from you. Connection. And the, the fourth C is continuity. Continuity is that I'm not going to go weeks and weeks and weeks on end without having a connection. The, the best thing to ruin a relationship is um, time without speaking to somebody. Now, there are, there are friends that I have that um, life has gotten in the way and, um, and, you know, it goes months before we talk to each other and we can pick it up, but that's not the, that, that is not a healthy relationship. A healthy relationship is when you dedicate time and effort to stay up and to keep in contact and keep connected and keep conversation and communication going on a continually continuous basis basis. We need continuity with God. I'm coming to a close. The last, um, ship <clears throat> that we're going to be on to this new world is finally we've 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 courted him through courtship um we are we have become more like him through fellowship and we now are in relationship with him now we know about him and this is what he is after for each and every one of us it the path to this new world is not for the faint of heart you will you have to be committed you have to want to be there and every relationship requires commitment. Commitment. Once you are in a, an official relationship, it, if it's Facebook official, um, you're not ashamed of your partner. You want the whole world. You're shouting from the rooftops. This is my th this is my girlfriend. This is my boyfriend. Um, if you're, you're if you're friends with somebody, um, you're not ashamed of that person. You you don't mind being out in public with that person, um, even if they're quirky. You don't mind. Why? Because you are now you you have established who they are you they've established who you are and you are not ashamed to be there you start introducing them to your friends to your parents you you aren't afraid of asking for their vote of confidence because you don't really care what they think you are 
in love. You're in a relationship now. You have found your match. You know this person through courtship. You you have you've met them where they are through fellowship, and now you're comfortable showing them to those closest to you. You anticipate going to church when you're in a relationship. You look forward to it. You invite people to come with you because you think it's worth being worth being invited to. You aren't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You aren't ashamed of what your church is about and what your church believes and what your church looks like and what it sounds like. You aren't even ashamed if tongues and interpretation goes out on a Sunday because you know that what they feel in that place is real. You're not ashamed. You are now in relationship with God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I believe this gospel works. I believe the Holy Ghost is real. I believe that it is given and the evidence of speaking of tongues is real. I believe that um, there is tongues and interpretation. I believe that people can come into the house of God and they can be healed. They can be touched. They can be filled with God's spirit. They can come up to, they can come up and, and get pray, prayed for. They can, they can have, uh, be exuberant in their worship. And guess what? I'm not ashamed of that. I will never be ashamed of that. Why? It's because of the word of God tells me it's in it. I know God enough to know that in those moments that he is in it, that is who he is. And so I have through courtship and through fellowship, now I'm in relationship and I am unashamed of my partner. I'm unashamed to be like him. I'm unashamed to dress like him. I'm unashamed to do what he's telling me to do, to live like he's telling me to live. I'm, I am unashamed. I am proud of this relationship. I'm I'm proud of experiencing him through baptism. I'm I'm ex I'm I'm proud to tell people that they need to be baptized. I'm proud. I am proud. I'm proud. Because I've been in this thing since my entire life. And like David, I can look back and say, you know what? This relationship is the best thing that has ever happened to me. I know people that have that have lived 60, 70, 80 years of their life and they have loved every minute of it. Do they have trials? Yes. Do they have circumstances? Yes. Have they had um, spats with the Lord? Absolutely. Do they agree with everything that's going on in their life? No, but guess what? They are in the best relationship of their life. Why? Is because they have given God their life. And when you give God their life and you start headed towards somewhere, it's not just this world. It's not just our flesh. We are headed to this glorious place and that that the only way to get there is through relationship with him it's through relationship and it takes work our walk with god takes work we can't put it on cruise control we can't we can't just think that we can live however we want to live and and make it there no it takes work hard work look at any marriage that have lasted um, any period of time and ask them if it's been easy or if it or if it's just come naturally. Absolutely not. Ask any friend that has been friends for um, longer than uh, 20 years and ask them if um, if that was easy. No, it takes work. It takes constant contact. It, it takes being involved in their life. It takes knowing their kids. It takes um, knowing their ups and their downs. It takes going to a funeral. It takes going to a wedding. It It takes work. You cannot live wrong and die right. You can't expect to not have a relationship with God. That's why That's why um, Jesus says um, that many in the last day will say, Lord, Lord, um, let me enter into your kingdom. And he says, I never knew you. That is a, that is a very intimate no, because there will be people that will, have, will try to get in heaven in the last day. They will try to get into this new world but they didn't put in the work in this world. Relationships take work. We must be a people who live right. In order to get to the new world, we've got to keep courtship, fellowship, and our relationship with God in constant contact with each other. We're headed to this new world. We're headed to a world that he's placed for us, that we may know him, so that way he one day will know us and say, enter in thou good and faithful servant. servant. Amen. How did Christopher Columbus discover what he did? Why is he in, why does he matter? Why is he in our uh, textbooks? It's because the, those boats, those boats weren't developed for long voyages. 
They were merchant ships. They weren't large vessels. Christopher Columbus literally traveled off of known maps. If you look at the maps, you see the serpent, right? They literally went into the unknown parts. They thought it was, they thought the world was flat. They thought they were going to go off the map. But yet those ships got them into a new world. And there are, in this relationship with God, there will be unknowns. There will be days that we don't understand why we're doing what we're doing. There will be things that God asks us to do that we don't understand. There will be times that we're being asked just to be faithful and just to trust and just to believe on him. And we don't know why. But I t- I'm telling you tonight, if you will just put your trust in this relationship, if you'll just commit to this relationship, if you'll just continue to find the new things of God and let him surprise you, one day on the horizon, someone's going to say, land ho, land ho. And the new world is going to be before us and we'll be in front of our master, the one that we've been traveling towards, and we'll get to see him face to face and our lives will be changed forever, forever and ever. For your world to change, to change the lives of people that follow you, you too have to be in a voyage. What, Wherever you are in your walk with God, I'm asking you tonight to check whether or not you have your three ships with you. Are you still courting him? Are you still giving him, giving him your intention to be with him forever, to commit to him, to give vows to him that through sickness, through death, that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be with him through, through sickness and health. Are you going to be with him and through the, the thick and the thin? Are you going to be with him? That's what courtship is through fellowship. Are you going, are you going to commit to become like him, to be holy as he is holy and to change your life because that's what he's asking you to do? And in your relationship, are you are you committed? Are you truly committed to having a relationship with him? I'm asking you tonight to look deep into yourself and ask yourself, how is your relationship with God? How is your relationship with God?